You're listening to The Authenticity Show, where you get to eavesdrop on great conversations about health, creativity, and the quest for excellence. Your hosts are Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Today, Carlos and Satch are discussing qi, the ancient Chinese concept of energy or life force, and what it means in different contexts and different fields, including martial arts, acupuncture, and hypnosis. I want to talk about chi. Yeah. I'd love to talk about chi because I've got opinions, gripes, groans, whimpers, whines, all these things about, about the word chi. And it's funny because I, I find that, well, well, first of all, let me say this. You're an interesting, interesting person to have this conversation with <laughs> because we've both been studying the chi arts for many, many, many years. Yeah. And uh, we continue to study chi. And it's interesting if I could go back in time and talk to my young self, like the version of me now, if I could go back and talk to the young me, I would give myself all kinds of advice about what she isn't and what she is. What's an example of some of that advice? So when I was first learning about chi, when you and I were first exploring chi as little, little young Kung Fuians, you know, <laughs> once upon a time, uh, I thought that chi was this, you know, sort of magical energetic force that can like project out of your palms and across the room and, and, you know, punch your opponent or fry them or stun them, you know, like, like a, um, electric stun gun, you know, isn't that's, it? yeah, isn't it? <laughs> right, right. And, and that's sort of what like I had. Like the emperor in Star Wars. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, when Darth Vader made the guy cough up the egg yolk, you know, that, that's what I thought, I thought she was, you know, <laughs> and then we were studying Kung Fu and we we're supposed to be doing internal Kung Fu. And so there's, we're, we're going to be cultivating our chi and we're practicing exercises like qigong qi cultivation you know all this stuff and then i studied chinese medicine studied acupuncture and i still carried that view you know in, into my chinese medicine training and it didn't serve me i thought it was serving me fast forward to today you know i've had many years now of, of working with qi as as a clinician you know in addition to you know, as a martial artist, I have a very different view of Chi now. Very, very, very different view. And I have come to the conclusion that Chi is a metaphor. I, I think of it like this. Chi is something different to different people depending on their profession. You know, to a feng shui master, Chi is an external thing that has to do with the movement of wind and water and energy and, you know, in the environment, mm -hmm. it's, it's an external type of a, a phenomenon to an acupuncturist. It's an internal phenomenon. It's something that you manipulate when you stick needles in people. It's something that uh, is supposed to flow through your body in, in particular ways, right? If you're a martial artist, chi is, um, maybe at least in some contexts is some sort of powerful weapon. Mm -hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? So right. depending on who you are, um, chi is something different. So is chi all of those things? I think it is. Is it each one of those individual things? Yeah. And I started to realize studying Chinese medicine that chi is an enzyme reaction in your pancreas. You know, chi is ions flowing across the membrane of an axon while the nerve depolarizes, you know, Qi is a hormone docking on a receptor. Um, qi is, you know, to a martial artist, qi is outstanding body alignment and sensitivity and knowing your joints and understanding physics. You know? What about a pulse in your uh, musculature that is an electro, uh, you know, electrochemical pulse that allows a strong force to be released through your. Right, right. And that's chi too. Yeah. You know? And so that's the idea. It's like I, I started when I when I started thinking of chi as not a magical electro electromagnetic type of energy, mm -hmm. but as uh, you know, 
to, to use this chunk up idea, in order to understand chi, you got to chunk up really high. <laughs> yeah, you do. You can chunk down into individual things, and that's chi too. But you got to chunk up way high to really understand what chi is, and it's a metaphor. I laugh when I read articles or I hear reports of you know some physicist somewhere who's trying to find some new way to to measure this chi stuff to find out if it's real or not. I think barking up the wrong tree. Hmm. That's like trying to get a team of physicists or biophysicists or you know physiologists or neuroscientists together to do a very serious investigation about where mojo is located in your body. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And and while we're at it, let's let's um let's see if we can investigate pizzazz because maybe it's not mojo, maybe it's been pizzazz this whole time. Well, I think uh, it's all about the jazz hands myself. Yeah, there you go. Right, right. <laughs> so, um to say that somebody's got spirit, energy, charisma, machismo, right? Mm -hmm. Those are all metaphors, aren't they? They're they're words that symbolize these things that are sort of intangible and without words like that we'd have no way of sharing those ideas but we all know that there's something there yeah it's you know? nominalizations and it's it's chunked up language like you said mm -hmm. and i think in order to pretend that you know or even to think that you know you have to chunk up yourself the listener as you hear it you chunk up and you try to match it to something you think is the thing that they're referring to Mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously vague in nature, and you decide that you do know what they're talking about, but you don't really. Yeah. You just made the decision that you did. Right. It's different. Right. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, so you're sort of speaking in this uh, uh, meta-language, meta-speak mm -hmm. kind of way, and yeah, it's not yeah. precise. Well, you know what's cool about words like that, words like pizzazz and machismo and chi and prana, things like that, is that having those words allows you to accomplish things you wouldn't otherwise be able to accomplish. And so I think of it like this. If, I, if I'm holding a calculator and I'm trying to add and subtract and multiply and divide large quantities of apples and oranges, I know that apples and oranges are not actually inside the calculator. Right. You know, I know that, that those little marks, those little, those little numbers that, are, that I'm seeing through the screen of the calculator are representing apples and oranges. And in the same way, I think the word chi in medicine, in martial arts, in feng shui, I think that is a word that has the ability to represent phenomenon that some, some of it we understand and some of it we don't yet understand. And it still allows us to come to a conclusion that's beneficial. So here's what I mean. Um, there's a, there's a, been a movement over the last 10, 12, you know, years or so, maybe longer, um, based upon the writings of a particular author who I won't name right now, who has in the acupuncture community really criticized the idea of chi. And he said, you know, uh, basically telling everybody, don't worry, you can still get good results. And it's not your fault that you believe this, this ridiculous concept of chi, right? Mm. Um, and see, I think he's wrong too. I think both have been wrong. You mm -hmm. know, that we have to understand if we look at chi as a metaphor, it allows us to figure out solutions to problems that would have been hard to figure out. So for example, um, I can use the metaphor of chi to treat neck pain and headaches and digestive problems and, you know, mm -hmm. things like that, right? Even though I may not understand exactly what's causing the neck pain or the digestive problem and so on. So then a new disease comes into the scene. Uh, go back to the eighties when AIDS was a new phenomenon. Um, had we ditched the chi metaphor, you know, a hundred years ago, said, oh, this is stupid. This is crap. Get rid of it, right? A new disease like AIDS comes along and nobody even knows exactly what it is yet. You know, we're still trying to figure out, you know, it's some kind of virus and, and nobody knows where it came from and how, you know, I mean, there's all these unknowns. The chi metaphor works in that situation. You can still come up with a diagnosis that has a set of treatment principles that can get you at least some kind of consistent results, right? Yeah, so yeah. maybe somebody comes to me and they say, the doctor doesn't know if I have fibromyalgia or MS or chronic fatigue syndrome or some latent Lyme disease. Nobody knows what I have, right? I can say, that's okay. I don't need to know what that diagnosis is. I can still use my Chinese medicine metaphors that will lead me to a conclusion 
of which will be a particular herb formula or a particular set of acupuncture points. And at least I can offer you something. What were your original feelings and thoughts and experiences about chi? I think they're so similar to your own. I mean, um, you know, the magical thinking around it, you know, it's, it's, it's all the legends, it's all the stories, it's you know, what I was told. I mean, there may have been, um, you know, well, certainly supernatural, I was going to say spiritual and even mm-hmm. religious components to things um, that have to do with uh, the transmission of and reception of energy. Yeah. And, and again, another nominalization, right? Another chunked up word um, that can't be put in a wheelbarrow. It's just one of those intangibles. It's a yeah. um, this broad term, which I think it gathers meaning as we put our mind to studying it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it starts accumulating things over time. And for me, it did. I was under the impression that the prayer, the meditation, the visualized energy was the same as the energy that you could get through practicing harnessing your breath and focusing your mind in various parts of your body and and doing certain rhythmic movements. Sure. All of which now I uh, utilize as a trance induction, um, as a, as a hypnotist, that's kind of important. And I look, I don't diminish what I learned before, but I certainly find ways of of translating it across and realizing that that it fits the metaphor of chi is a great trance induction mm-hmm. i mean i can i i can and i have and probably will continue to utilize chi inductions for hypnosis in certain cases where it's called for nice yeah um, that's cool you know you, you, you and i were talking yeah. about internal representations the last yeah. time yeah, yeah and you know i realized that so many things fit into that i yeah. mean this is a great example because yeah. you've got an idea of something that is being represented mm-hmm. in your mind yeah. as something else. And you, uh, well, the person doing this mm-hmm. automatically assumes that the thing that they're thinking of is the thing that they're picturing on the outside. Mm-hmm. So, so that external thing that they believe they're doing or interacting with is it can easily get confused with the thing that they're holding in their mind. So the picture of it, the image of it, uh, the metaphor that you said Mm -hmm. of it, and they confuse the metaphor for the thing itself. I certainly have had lots of experiences of what I thought of as chi and maybe still do think of as chi from time to time. And I, I like yourself, Mm -hmm. um, have a adjustable mindset around it. It's like if, the definition needs to shift according to my circumstances. I'm okay with that. We're talking about a world that involves very abstract concepts, creativity and feelings, and that's very much a part of living life and healing yeah, mentally, emotionally, and physically. Right. So the answers are not really only relegated towards these linear, analytical, scientifically verifiable, provable things. And I say things, I mean actual substances mm-hmm. sure. you know, that can be measured. They may or may not be ultimately uh, contained by that mindset and right. those set of rules. I think there's so much of life which is subjective that if you don't deal with subjective reality or if you don't acknowledge the power and the potency and the importance of subjective reality, you're missing a huge part of it. My experience growing up with chi was uh, having a lot of uh, uh, rules around it, a lot of rules for how to cultivate it, um, how to not lose what you had attained. Don't spill it. 
don't yeah, don't right. spill your chi. Don't man. you dare spill your chi. Yeah, yeah. you get or back that you, pain and knee pain and right, yeah. or you'll corrupt your uh, your chi, the virtue, mm-hmm. like the the Taoists used the the word da right, yeah. Dao, as in Tao Te Ching. Yeah, right that, right. that idea of virtue wasn't just virtuous behavior. Mm-hmm. You know, as I learned it from the esoteric Taoist perspective, it was mm-hmm. also a quality that you could attain that was. Oh not easily described and so they translated it as virtue but it also translates as power and that power is right. like personal power mm-hmm. not just uh like political personal power or social economic personal power but yeah. the sort of a raw almost magical power that was wielded by a person who cultivated the right mindset yes. and chi yeah right right it's part of it so it, it yeah. you know it's i mean how do you understand that if you didn't have the background of learning qigong learning about taoism yeah uh, studying martial arts i mean th- there's a there's a lot to what i just said which might sound like i was being specific but there's a lot of gray area yeah. abstract stuff going on in what i just sure. said that sure. i think a listener listening to this would be like well i I don't know. I guess I get it, but not really. Mm -hmm. I mean, what if you're a Hawaiian and you learn about mana? Sure. Mana is another word for something I'm comparing with chi, but from their perspective, mana is mana. Yeah. There is no comparison. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. It's sort of like the, 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 like the word love exists in every culture. Right. You know, and, and no, it's love. No, 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 it's prema. You know, no, 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 it's, you know, all these different words, but, but it's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing, you know. And isn't love um, hormones? And isn't love um, uh, neurons depolarizing in different parts of the brain? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like so. It's chi, you know, pretty much. You know, <laughs> it's funny because like in in Chinese medicine or or in the, the Taoist arts and things, they talk about the three treasures. Yeah, Jing, Qi, and Shen. Right. Right. Um, Jing, you know, essence, for lack of a better term, uh, uh, the essence of life. You know, um, as very much a stored you know, physical substance from your kidneys, you know, uh, you know, sexual juice and things like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So Jing Chi Shen. So, so we've got essence Chi as we're talking about, you know, um, which literally means air, right. Jing Chi and then Shen, which means spirit, you know, or mind. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you study Chinese medicine, you realize that those things are all the same thing. Jing essence, when it becomes a little less, less solid it's chi you know and takes chi and essence to make a healthy spirit or mind you know so really it's the same thing like you're talking about something at different stages of refinement and existence yeah yeah like water ice versus liquid versus vapor vapor you know yeah. yeah it's funny you know the the um since we're talking about chi and vapors and all that, you know, the, the Chinese character for chi is, um, the radical for rice. Okay. Right. And, and then it's the radical for rice combined with a radical that indicates a steamy, um, gaseous vapor. Like it's being cooked. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like steam coming off rice. Yeah. And, and what does that mean? You know I mean? Well, in some ways it's something very literal. It means that, you know, you, you eat food and you get energy to live. If you don't have it, you're going to die. You know what I mean? So, um, yet the word itself literally translates, even in modern Chinese today, as air. You know, yeah. and and uh, um, breath. Yeah, you know, and and, and and yeah, breath, air. You know, um, and so you could think of it as, you know, is it oxygen? Yeah, it's that too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that too. And is oxygen or or is breathing involved in the transmutation? And utilization of the sugars from, say, rice. Rice, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. That's of what course, you're, yeah, yeah. you're breathing and you're moving and you're activating. I mean, that that is exactly, in you know, that's very involved in the process of digestion. Right. Um, you know, Ayurveda has very similar concepts to this. They have, mm-hmm. um, you know, for, instead of Jing or essence, they they have ojas. That's right, ojas. Yeah, and that's right. and shukra. Shukra is like the uh, the sexual essences okay. specifically. Yeah. Uh, so it's a form of ojas and okay. related to ojas, but it isn't ojas. Ojas is also a substance that gets um, uh, transported between the organs mm. and is involved in 
it, they often call it the container. It's what okay. contains the the prana, yeah. uh, keeps it from burning out, basically. Okay. So prana is the breath energy. Yeah. And then the spirit energy that's sometimes called tejas. It's okay. Like the light that comes off of a person, oh, which is a, yeah. uh, related to the idea of fire. Nice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, it gets complicated. I mean, as with Chinese yeah. medicine, you could get very, very detailed and come up with these sort of sub um, categories that link yeah. things together and, and allow for the different uh, manifestations. Yeah. Um, but basically there are three basic ones. Yeah. Okay. It's, isn't yeah. that funny how in, in both medicines and all this, yeah. you know, the, those things are there. Um, Huge continents, but yet they have, you know. Yeah, own, exactly. It's many exactly. Similarities. Yeah. Yeah. So chi, it's a fascinating, fascinating idea, you know. I mean, I guess like we earlier we had talked about, you know, I was, I, I was stating that if I could go back and talk to my old self as a young acupuncturist or a young martial artist, you know, what would I share? You know, I would share the idea that stop thinking about this in a magical way. You had used the term magical thinking earlier, yeah. right? Don't think of it as a magical thing. Think of it as a very down to earth thing. And when you approach it from that perspective, you end up having breakthroughs that seem magical. Listening to the Authenticity Show, where you get to eavesdrop on great conversations about health, creativity, and the quest for excellence. Your hosts are Carlos Casados and Satch Purcell. Next up, Carlos and Satch continue their conversation about chi. Uh, uh, a young acupuncturist, what I had learned in school seldom got me results. Or I could get results, but it took a lot of treatments, you know, and it wasn't very practical. Fast forward many years, and now I can use one needle, two needles, a few needles, and get rapid, instant results, right? What helped that happen? Well, a lot of that was continuing education courses and, you know, learning from other people that had a more down to earth experience and understanding about what she was. And one of my breakthroughs was uh, studying with uh, a man by the name of Richard Tan, who recently passed away. Um, I, didn't know I think it was either earlier this year or last year, he, 2016, 2015, he, he passed away very recently. Um, and I had the great fortune of attending some, um, uh, some of his workshops and he was an amazing acupuncturist and he said something that that really helped me solidify my growing understanding of what she really was as a metaphor i mean i had this idea that she's a metaphor but he really showed me how to understand it truly as a metaphor in a way that will get you awesome results right mm. <laughs> and he and he said something um he was he was he was using the bagua Right, right, and the different guas that make up the trigrams, and he was explaining about how in in acupuncture theory there are different divisions of yin and yang, and how different divisions will balance other divisions. It gets very technical, right? It's very technical and mathematical. And what he was talking about was how we have the wrong idea. We think that when we're balancing somebody's chi, we're balancing it in their body. He says that's not what they're talking about. They're talking about balancing it on paper. And I went, oh man, that is so right. You balance the channels on paper. That tells you which zones of the body and which points you need to choose that instantly cause the body to create these responses. Some we understand, like endorphins being released, um, you know, microcirculation being adjusted, you know, the little things like that that we do understand, plus probably all kinds of things that we don't understand. Mm. You know, and the chi metaphor allows those things to happen, even though we don't understand all of them, you know, yeah. um, but balancing your channels and your chi on paper was the key. And it brought it down to earth in a way that 
clicked in my mind and I thought, now I'm getting results that seem magical to outsiders that look at it. By balancing on a paper, that's interesting. Yeah. Are you saying um, that it should make sense with a theory and that you should do the sort of calculations and the uh, the adjustments so that it makes sense on paper and then yes. you actually select from that and that yes. those things you select from that okay exactly we'll, yeah. we'll give you the profound quote-unquote yeah. magical results i'll g give you an example um let's say somebody has knee pain okay let's say they have left knee pain and it's on on sort of the the outside front of their knee okay so you know like underneath your kneecap on the outside, you have a little dimple, a little depression under your knee, and then on the you have a you have one on the the inner side, so there's a lateral depression and a medial depression. Mm -hmm. Let's say somebody has pain around that lateral, that outside depression. Under okay. Their knee. Okay. Okay. In acupuncture, we would say, oh, that's the stomach channel. That zone has been assigned the stomach channel, and it has a name according to Yin and Yang called Yang Ming, and that means Yang brightness. Okay. So there's a Yang brightness zone on the leg and there's a young brightness zone on the arm. The leg is going towards the ground. That's yin. Huh. Your arm is higher in your body. That's, that's young. So one's yin, one's yang. So how do you treat knee pain in that spot? Well, use yang to treat it. So you go to the opposite elbow, the right elbow, and you go to the large intestine channel, which is the hand yang ming, the hand yang bright channel. And you stick a needle in it in the elbow because the elbow corresponds to the knee. And then their knee pain goes away. <laughs> wow. So on paper, I would do that. I would say, well, where is the pain? Oh, it's, it's this particular channel. Well, what are the other channels that mathematically can balance that channel? And I would say, okay, well, that's foot yang ming. That's the stomach channel. So that could be balanced by the large intestine channel. That could be balanced by the kidney channel. That could be balanced by the lung channel. That could be balanced by the spleen channel. Those are my choices which which one am I going to use? Pick one. And they all work. <laughs> wow. You know, and it works amazingly fast. It's instantaneous. And it seems like magic. It, it gives me the result that is as magical as my initial feelings of falling in love with the idea of chi when I was, you know, a, a, yeah. a kid studying Kung Fu. Well, I think someone listening to that would, would be forgiven for thinking that that is very magical thinking. You know, that, that you mm -hmm. can treat the opposite elbow to affect the opposing knee. Yeah. And yet we all essentially developed out of a single cell. Yeah. How could right. it not be that everything is connected yeah. at some level? Right. That you could right. treat a part of their body that would affect another part of the body. And just knowing that uh, there is a system for figuring out why you can treat yeah. an elbow and have it affect in the opposing knee yeah that's neat that's it really neat. cool it's pretty cool isn't yeah it? yeah it's pretty cool so people people can get so i think hung up on that idea of like that doesn't make sense because they're working with a model that's limited it's working with a model that yes. goes off of their current understanding and it doesn't involve chinese medical theory and right, things like right. that so. you know i i sort of like like the uh, idea of imagine some physicians traveled deep into the jungle or some sort of remote area and they met an indigenous group of people that had no contact with the outside western world and they had no idea what like a western physician was that was a completely foreign concept to them and let's say somebody had pneumonia and a doctor a physician out there pulled out a syringe and gave them a shot in their butt of an antibiotic <laughs> you know and treated their pneumonia and they got better yeah if you didn't have a concept of what an antibiotic is and what bacteria are and how antibiotics could travel through the bloodstream and, you know, reach different parts of the body, you'd think, what is the connection between my cough and my ass? I don't see the connection. But we have an understanding of what those connections are, so it yeah. makes perfect sense. Well, that's a, that's a perfect analogy. And thanks for making that because <laughs> you're right. Uh, it's just as strange if you don't understand how it works. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah equally totally. strange and somebody um you practice hypnosis yeah somebody has the wrong idea about what hypnosis is and what a trance state is and they think of you know some sitcom they saw when somebody got hypnotized and you know cluck like a duck or or no chickens cluck cluck right. like a chicken right 
That's even more hypnotic if they can cluck like a duck. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's very advanced. So they bark skills. like a chicken even sometimes. Yeah, exactly. That yeah. gets crazy. Yeah, or sound like a color. That would be, oof, man. We better stop. Okay. So, um, you know, if somebody has the wrong concept, the wrong internal representation of what hypnosis is, yeah. you know, <laughs> then it doesn't make sense. I had really bad cat allergies from the time I was nine to, well, I must have been 30 something. Okay. When I, I uh, went to one of my hypnosis teachers who said, hey, is anybody here suffering from allergies? We were doing a group class. I think it was an NLP class. And I said, sure, I do. And he asked. I was the one he picked as the demo subject. And I didn't know if it was going to work. I just thought it would be great if it does. Mm -hmm. And so I went up and I cooperated. I participated fully in what it is he was asking me to do, which took about all of maybe 15 minutes or something. He asked me to... Um, you know, picture the thing that caused the allergy. Okay. And, you know, he asked me a few questions about that. He elicited my state. And then um, he elicited um, something that was similar, but doesn't cause a reaction. Okay. You know, he basically used NLP to kind of cross them, yeah. map them across in a way. Okay. And um, from that moment on, I have not had a single... Uh, itchy eye, runny nose, wow. headache, uh, stuffiness, nothing uh, from being exposed to cat hair or cat dander. Even wow. when I've been at places where they had, you know, six to nine cats in the house. Wow. Well, you've pet my cat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> thing no is, problem. Yeah. I would have been so itchy before. I would have huh. just been so uncomfortable. I still liked cats. Yeah. I always liked cats. But wow. um, I just, my body didn't react well to it until... Yeah. I did this um, allergy desensitization yeah. protocol. That is, that is some serious mind medicine. Oh, it's it's awesome. Yeah. And now I've I've shared that gift with others, and I've helped others to to get rid of their allergies the same way. Recently, I read an article uh, where some um, neuroscientist or some anatomist had actually discovered tiny little lymphatic vessel vessels that um, have a direct connection to the brain, and this was thought to have not existed previously. That's right. Yeah, and and how could it, we have gone that long? Yeah, I for mean, we, centuries, exactly. you know, opening up cadavers. Right, right. And we didn't know that there was uh, that this actually yeah. existed. That it that that. It connected directly to right. the brain. And so that basically proves, you know, for, for anybody who's maybe not, not familiar with what the lymphatic system is, it's, it's um, the circulatory system for your immune system, you know? And so there was thought to have not been a direct connection between the brain and your immune system, and they just found it, like, within the last year or so. You know, just found it, you right. know? And... and uh, Apparently, the way the structures were, it was very difficult to identify. Yeah. And this individual figured it out, and he saw it, and he's proven it, and it's, it's, it's a, a, a well-understood thing now that, that yeah. yeah, your brain physically, literally connects to your immune system. So It does. How couldn't a hypnotic state have an influence on your immune system and solve your cat allergy? You know I mean? There, right. there's, there's a direct link there. It's there. And that's a physical, um, that's certainly physical evidence. Uh, the other kinds of evidence they've amassed over years and years um, about the effect of stress on the body. And Mayo Clinic did tons and tons of studies on, um, you know, the effect of stress on inflammation and the effect of uh, basically trance states, uh, deep relaxation states, uh, hypnosis yeah. and meditation on uh, the inflammatory response. And, you know, you know, as a, mm -hmm. as a medical person how inflammation long-term inflammation really is responsible for so many problems from oh, heart yeah. disease to Absolutely. cancer to you know um even things like diabetes and other things over the time it just the destruction of the tissue yeah the destruction of the nervous system from uh, long-term unmanaged rampant systemic inflammation 
yeah. and how that can affect your health is huge. And if the basics, you know, taking care of the treasures, right? Um, yeah. What you yeah. eat and the exercise you're doing, and then the mindset. So the prayer, meditation, mm-hmm. the the uh, uh, managing of emotions, the the uh, things like hypnosis, reframing, NLP, stuff that you can do that can manage your mental state. You know, you, you've got to, you mm-hmm. have to manage. Yeah. You know, your your yeah. sleep, your diet, your exercise, and your mindset. Those are like absolutely, you know, indispensable. You yeah. have to do all those things. There's there's a, um, in the acupuncture community here in the United States, uh, there was a well-known author and lecturer. Uh, his name was Bob Flaws. He's yeah. an acupuncturist, herbalist. And he used to often talk about the three free therapies and that's exercise, diet, and lifestyle. Yeah. You know, and lifestyle being, being, you know, your, your, your thoughts, your emotions, you know, your habits, you know, things like that. Um, You and I have both done uh, sensory deprivation floats. Yeah. Right. I remember the first time I did a float, I described it as an anti-inflammatory activity. Yeah, you know? that's right. That's <laughs> there are anti-inflammatory right. drugs. Well, uh, floating in pitch blackness is an anti-inflammatory activity. And I could feel it in my body. Yeah, it's wonderful. You know? Yeah. Highly recommended for anyone who's listening Absolutely. to this. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, oh. sleep, uh, the, <laughs> no, I don't recommend sleep deprivation, but I do recommend yeah. sensory, sensory deprivation. Sensory deprivation, yeah. Yeah, right. it's good stuff. I mean, yeah, it's so it good for good you. stuff. Yeah, I love it, love it. But you know, uh, I'd like to loop this back to the idea of chi because yeah, chi. Um, the ability and skill of working with this abstract metaphor called chi and what benefit it can have. For one thing, the development of sensitivity. Yes. I don't mean uh, excessive sensitivity to your environment in a way that makes you more susceptible, but I mean the cultivation of sensitivity along with the strengthening of your mind and body. Yeah. Because there's this idea that comes along with development of chi. I mean, there, there's a, a pre-frame that you mm. accept when you practice qigong, which is yeah. when you develop your chi, you'll be increasing your immunity, your resistance to cold and heat, yes, your need for sleep, your quality of life, your physical power and strength, mm-hmm. your sexual virility, yeah. Your mental capacities, everything will increase as you increase your vitality through the practice of Qigong. So this preframe is accepted and hypnotically embedded as you practice Qigong every yeah. single day. Yeah. And you're you're developing this uh, subjective, uh, some might say imaginary mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. of um, a feeling of heat, pressure, tingling, movement, um, whatever you want to call it, that magnetic sensation that people describe often when they talk about having chi or feeling chi through their body or developing the ability to sense it between their hands or moving through their body in the various channels. The more you practice those things, uh, true or untrue, whether it's accurate or not accurate as a metaphor, it works and it does change the way you feel over time and some seemingly magical results can follow when you uh, you know, learn to practice it the right way and if you're consistent about it. I just think that's neat because whether it's true or not true, it has this amazing result. There's a technique that I learned from uh, some Australian acupuncturist that was traveling through, and for some reason I don't I don't remember his name. I was a student at the time. He showed up at the uh, South Baylor University uh, clinic, and he gave a little little impromptu in service to us. And he shared a technique where um, you put a needle in a point called pericardium six. It's called naguan, and it's on the inner part of your wrist, up up a you know couple inches from your wrist crease. And what you do is you put the needle in, you have to angle the tip of the needle a a particular way, and you give a very gentle stimulation to the needle. And then what you, the practitioner, do is you bring your eyes up from the point, maybe two or three inches 
you know, proximal from, from where the point is, you know, towards the elbow, and you focus right there. And then you tell the client, tell me if you start to feel a sensation um, above the point. And then the patient, after you know, some time, will say, yeah, yeah, I feel something you know, like a few inches up from where you're, you have the needle. And say, okay, tell me if you feel it anywhere else. And then you, the practitioner, bring your eyes to their elbow. And you focus on their elbow. And then they'll usually say, yeah, I feel this up to my elbow. And I say, okay. And then you bring your, you jump to their chest. Because the pericardium channel is basically, you know, it's connected to your heart, right? And so you bring your eyeballs, you know, <laughs> to their chest. And as you manipulate the needle, they'll usually say, oh yeah, I feel some kind of like nice warm sensation. Or I've had people tell me a cold sensation in their chest. And you know, is some of it leading the patient a little bit? You're like, you're leading the witness, you know? Huh. Yeah, but who cares? Uh, my professors would often talk about how back in China or Taiwan, you could take the old doctors and they could do the same points that the young doctors would do and they'd get results and the young acupuncturists didn't get as good of results, right? And why do they say that was? Because of their intent. Because they had... They were confident. They knew what they were doing. They knew those were good points and that those points work. You know, and I've got to say, I've had some experiences like that too. Um, when I first started doing acupuncture, I would hope that it would work. You know, oh, I hope this works. You know, my teachers say that it should work and the books say that this should work and I would hope that it would work. And sometimes it would work, sometimes it wouldn't. And then I'd, I'd see some master acupuncturist do the same darn stuff I was doing and get great results and be like, well, shoot, if they can get good results, why can't I? And then I did, hmm. you know? So yeah, intent is very important in medicine. It's also when, when the doctor um, is confident in telling the client, you know, that they're going to be okay. This is something we'll be able to resolve. You know, one time my wife had really, really, really bad vertigo. I mean, she was, it was to the point where, I mean, we went to the, the walk-in, you know, all the stuff. And it was so bad that like if we turned her wheelchair a little bit, she'd vomit. I mean, wow. and this went on for weeks and weeks. We're like, is this ever going to end? Oh my gosh, I hope this ends, you know? And she's taking medications and I was giving her herbs and we were doing everything we could. And we were not solving this vertigo problem. And she went and saw um, uh, an old neurologist who's a, an MS specialist. He's a wonderful man. He's since passed away. His name was um, Dr. Vandenort. Hmm. And he just had such great bedside manner. We just love Dr. Vandenort. And Tanya went to go see him. And in his Dr. Vandenort way, you know, he said, Oh, yes, I know these dizziness things. They just sort of sometimes th seem like they're going to just go on forever and ever and ever, but they don't. <laughs> they, awesome. they eventually get better. <laughs> we left that office and she was like, you know, 40% better just leaving his office because of his confidence, you know, his reassuring bedside manner. So, Gosh. You, know, you know, he was using ye, wasn't he? I mean, he's using flow, you know, he was in a flow state. Well, he was using intent. Talk about was, therapeutic yeah. use of self. Yeah. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, and you know, so us occupational therapists, like you just said, therapeutic yeah. use of self, we use that all the time. We <sighs> intend to do that. And I, I like to describe it as the phenomenon of give the patients what they want until they want what you have to give. Huh. And what do they want? You know, what they want is for you to listen to them, to hear them, to connect with them, to understand what they're going through. You know what I mean? And you do that first then they're willing to do what you want them to do because you know how as you as the practitioner know how to get them to do the right exercises and change their behaviors and you know take the right medicines or accept the right treatment you know whatever it is yeah. depending on your profession right it really comes down to build rapport and once you've done that then they'll follow you and you can lead them to to the watering hole that's great that's so great what you said before reminds me of uh, kind of an important statement that uh, people teaching hypnosis to others will say, um, go there first. And it just, hmm. it just refers to the idea that 
um, you know, as you're leading someone into trance, I mean, there used to be this idea that, you know, you had to resist going into trance and you had to make sure that the client went into trance. Mm-hmm. And, and that changed a lot with uh, Milton H. Erickson mm-hmm. and his students. So the idea like, no, it's perfectly okay for you. In fact, it's wonderful if you go into trance with them and beneficial even. Wow. Uh, because this process can be an unconscious um, process for the hypnotist just as much as it is. Yeah. Uh, with the, the hypno tea. So, so go there first. So there is a trance. trance state. Absolutely. You know, what's funny is I remember telling you not too long ago that I found it to be a wonderful personal practice or like a meditative practice is mm-hmm. when I treat somebody for a problem, I become very thankful and grateful for the fact that that aspect of my life is in good health. So like yeah. if, if somebody has um, digestive problems, while I'm treating them, I become very, I, I, I cultivate a sense of gratitude for my own strong digestion. Yeah. You know, or if somebody has ankle pain and I'm treating their ankle, I think, you know how fortunate I am that my ankle, you know, is in great shape and that I have healthy ankles and therefore that qualifies me to help their ankle. It would have protective qualities for you as well. You know, this whole idea of transference. Yeah. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, one of the positive transference. Yeah. One of the uh, ideas about transference is the idea that you can psychosomatically manifest uh, negative symptoms from identifying emotionally or empathically with the client. But if you said that, that would interrupt that thought. Be it would be a beneficial pattern interrupt that could Mm -hmm. have an effect uh, positively on yourself as well as the client. Because as you break that pattern in yourself, you're also helping to break it for them too. Yeah, and it prevents the unconscious transference that can happen if you're too emp- empathic. Mm-hmm. And um, oh yeah, yeah, you totally. don't you don't end up sort of unconsciously uh, activating all your mirror neurons and getting yourself to sort of try to unconsciously mimic the pattern of disharmony in yourself. Yeah, right. It's so like you hang, that. hang around with too many depressed people and you're depressed. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's right. Like, be or careful like, of that, like that you saying, know? you know, you you are like the, or you are uh, limited by the sort of the potential of of the the six people you hang out with the most. Yeah, yeah. So so it's almost like um, if I'm hanging out with depressed people, I need to be grateful and have so much gratitude for my own happiness. Yeah, you know what I mean. And then I can affect them in a positive way rather than the reverse. You know? Yeah. So. It's a much more uh, willed and there's much more intent behind yeah doing it that yeah. way yeah. Yeah. did you intend to say that oh gee i wonder yeah i would i would never do such a thing yeah intentionally you've been listening to the authenticity show with your hosts carlos casados and satch purcell the show is produced by Oliver Altine. Our theme music is composed by Oliver Altine. You can find more information on our website, AuthenticityShow.com. Thanks for listening, and have an authentic day.